We are going to have a quick C programming language review. This is, uh, of course, embedded systems, and uh, we took a, a, a quiz a little bit earlier to see how well we understood all of these concepts. And it, I think most everybody understood it, but there are some things, uh, nuances that I want to cover really quickly. Um, we've already talked about what happens uh, when you have a high programming language or why you have a high a uh, high level programming language. In other words, symbolic names are a lot better than register names like R1 and R2. You can actually give it uh, additional information. You can make the names fairly long so that they're somewhat, uh, uh, they describe something uh, in a little bit more detail than just A, B, and C, right? <coughs> also, it provides some abstraction of the underlying hardware. In other words, uh, it will not require you to know how many registers you had or how much memory you have. Uh, all you have to do is write the functionality of the software. And later on when we start working with uh, some of our include files associated with uh, the location of specific registers, peripherals and such, uh, all you have to do is refer to an individual name and you do not need to know its exact memory location. Uh, memory location meaning the specific address. Further, all the high level language will uh, allow you to use symbols that convey meanings, plus, minus, multiply, divide. And to some degree it safeguards against bugs, but it doesn't fully do that. There are some additional tools uh, one of my favorite tools that I've used uh, in the past is Lint. So how many of you have used a Lint or variation of that? No one. All right, Lint is a, uh, it's a extra program that you use to analyze your C language code and uh, I've also seen it called as C-Lint. And it will actually verify that you don't do things that are dumb. Uh, for example, you may have an array that may be 100, uh, 100 integers wide. And Lint will make sure that you don't try and address something beyond the 100 limit. Or it may see that you are trying to do a calculation uh, with a floating point and an integer at the same time. And it will say you may want to, the word is cast, one of those different uh, representations of numbers into the other and then have the calculation done correctly. So we're going to be using our integrated development environment. Uh, specifically a code project will be everything that you need inside that IDE to develop, compile, load, debug your program and when I say everything you need you will put all your different C files in there you will have your include your .h files if you have any assembly language files it will have that as well it will also have uh, libraries that you may access as well. Things like printf where you're not actually compiling the code, it's already been done for you. You'll have a name for that project like lab number seven and you could have any number of these different uh, types of files. When I worked uh, at Ericsson, for example, we had one mobile phone that had about 1,000 files. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were about 400 C files, about 400 include files, um, a, a bunch of other types of files like assembly language and, and some other libraries that would be used that were already compiled for the particular processor that we use. We use a, uh, an older, now it's an older Qualcomm uh, processor, one that also had digital signal processing in it. So to compile a C program, you have the C pro pro, or you have the preprocessor, macro substitution, source level transformation. You have the general compiler itself, which will have different parts 
that it uh, creates and then you'll have the final linker all the way at the end that will pull in your object files from libraries like the printf and also the, uh, the compiled code that you've written. All of that will be uh, used to generate an executable, executable image which will then be downloaded to your, uh, your target. Your target being the Renaissance RX 63 N board. So the compiler, as we mentioned, the source code analysis uh, in the preprocessor is the front end. It's actually going to parse the program to make sure that uh, its pieces are correctly identified. The variables in the right place, expressions in the right place, etc. Um, things like semicolons at the end. Then the code generation, if we look again up here, the code generation which is in the compiler part is our back end. So it'll create machine level code from which you can analyze or from the analyzed source and uh, you may add an optimization to it. An optimization example is perhaps you have a relatively constrained system when it comes to memory. So you can say when you compile code try and make it as compact as possible. Or you may optimize it for speed. In that case um, it may expand the size in memory but it's established such that it will try and run as fast as possible. And then uh, um, that uh, optimizing compiler you could also perhaps turn it off altogether when you're testing. You might want to do that because uh, you want to validate and go through the code specifically as, as you have written it. Now one other piece that's important is that inside your code you have symbol names, variable names. And the compiler will build a symbol table that will have a, um, an association between a specific variable name and a location of where that variable is. Later on that table is going to be using when, when the linker goes into effect because then it will be able to identify specifically where in memory that variable will be used. And that variable may be used in different modules so you want to make sure that a global variable for example which is viewable by everybody will be viewable by everybody and, and accessible by everybody. Now we've talked about memory maps so let's look at the specific memory map for the RX63N. So in this case the RAM is all the way up here at the top and so what I want you to do is to take a look at all the different things that we have or all the different space that we have and try and identify how much space we're actually using for each of the different areas. So remember what we've done, how to identify a particular uh, um, size of something. You know, you have the beginning and you should have an ending. I didn't have room in here so I didn't put it in here. You have a beginning and ending address for, uh, for each one of these. So what I want you to do is tell me how much space is this RAM? And how much space is allocated for this peripheral I.O.? Well, hold on, I'm going to have you do this offline. There's another area here which is data flashes. Uh, historically we know that as double EEPROM, right? And then we have several areas which are going to be allocated for um, specifically program ROM. And what I want you to do, I believe that uh, this is going to be the area that we identify for user ROM. In other words, flash, how much flash will you use and be able to program 
All the other uh, flash down here is used for some, you know, for example, on-chip ROM, program ROM. So uh, I want you to just look at these four areas and tell me how long they are. All right, take a few minutes to figure that out. All right, let's uh, let's take a look. What do you what do you have here for RAM? How many K? All right, 96K. The IO space is how many K? 512. Oh, I hear 512, I hear 128. Which one is it? You sit 512K? Yes, no, what is it? <laughs> uh, Y'all need to decide which one is it. <laughs> Since it's half of this space, I know it's not going to be uh, one, one gig, right? I think it's 512, right? Who votes 512? Who votes 128? Who has no idea and didn't raise their hand for either? <laughs> All right, we'll go with 512. EEPROM? Okay. And ROM? That's all I heard. <laughs> How much? 820? 220? 320? Hmm. Okay. Now, one thing I want to point out is that, oh my gosh. Look what that says. Well, you know, I'm, we're going to verify this in just a few minutes. On chip program ROM, write only. On chip program ROM, read only. What? Why is that? Well, this is the same space. This is the same on chip ROM or flash. But they have a different address for programming it and a different address for reading it and using it. But you also notice that there's a couple of other areas here for ROM that are associated with other uses like user boot and FCU firmware. And the best way to understand what that is is to look at the uh, the manual, and by the way, this is, uh, have I shown you this already in the past? Yeah, I believe I have, right? This is the, uh, uh, the user's manual, the hardware user's manual for the chip that we're using. And this is the place that you should really, or this is where you really need to reference something should you need to know how to program or how to use a particular register or uh, functionality of the entire chip. Uh, you should uh, read this entire thing front to back. It's only about 2,000 pages. No, you shouldn't read it front to back. That's why it has this lovely thing over here called a table of contents. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to be looking at, uh, in particular, let's go down to the address space area and we'll take a look at, oh, look at this, something nice and uh, nice and big and we'll just uh, blow this up a little bit. Since we're going to be running in single chip mode, let's look at this. Oh, look at that. There's the RAM and is that the same space that I showed earlier? Oh, it's a little bit different. Why is that? Well, let's see. Is this a different processor? Let's see if I have... Uh, accessible areas will differ according to the operating mode and control of the status bits. So let's take a look. Well, if you notice down here, it has a little bit more information with respect to, oh, if your RAM is different, they just showed one example up there. <clears throat> so in our example, 
Uh, we were looking at, what was that address before? Uh, 180000. Uh, one. I am missing it. Where is it? It's not even in here. So uh, I guess it's a different variant for, for that. Uh, you know what, that may be the RX-62N. Hmm, maybe I should fix that in my slides. So this will be the, uh, the address range depending on the particular chip that we have. So we're going to have to look up our chip to see how much it, uh, it'll store. The other is that uh, here's the capacity. Notice it has an address for reading only and an address for programming only. So this prevents you from being able to change code while you're running it because it's going to be a totally different address. Uh, historically, some uh, processors allowed you to have what we call self-modifying code which is a really, really bad way to write software um, because you never knew what it would be. So we'll, we'll look at examples of that later. All right, I think with this we're going to go on. We've visited this in the past, but just as a, uh, a reminder, if we have a variable, this variable could be called what we have as an automatic variable, and those are stored on the stack. Or we can have a static variable that starts with an initial value, and if it starts with an initial value, then it will be both in the RAM and the initial value will be in ROM. And if it has no initial value, then it'll only appear in RAM. Now when we're talking about static variables, we're looking at those variables that we often call global variables, something available to all of the functions. You could also have fixed data, and fixed data, constants, character strings. A good example is if you want to display something on a screen, and uh, like an introduction screen. That is going to be stored in ROM because it's never going to change. And of course your program is going to be stored in the ROM area as well. And the ROM that we use is called Flash. So just as a recap, let's look at local and global variables. Now what would you call a global variable here? Which one? All right, in global right here. And the local variables would be right here. So I'm going to break for a moment and say what will be the value Let's say we, oh yeah, these have all the values here. What will be the value of this and this, these two uh, variables, after this code executes? And why is this code not uh, optimal? So we'll spend a couple minutes, uh, talk with your neighbor on that. We'll visit back. All right, we are back. And uh, uh, first things first, what is your answer here? Four. All right. And uh, what is your answer here? Six. Six. And what did, what is the, what's going on with that uh, statement right there? You didn't figure out how to minimize it? Say that again? It cancels out. Ah, something cancels out. So let's look at this. This is really the same as in local plus in global minus in local plus in global. So you have an in local minus an in local, which gives you, no, well, it cancels each other out, right? And then you have in global plus in global, which is two times in global, or what's a, we, we've talked a little bit about code. There are two ways to write that, three ways to write that, in fact, right? It would be in global plus in global, that's one. Number two would be two times, 
And number three would be shift. Shift it over one bit. And so, which is faster? Shifting. Uh, typically shifting is faster depending on your computer architecture. Um, in some cases it doesn't matter because an arithmetic operation takes the same amount of time whether it be shifting or multiplying or, uh, or adding. In most cases, especially with older processors, there is a distinct difference. Um, adding takes more time than shifting and multiply takes a lot more time than adding. Another example, we're going to actually look at this one in a little bit of detail. A little bit of detail meaning that we're going to see what happens inside memory with respect to the uh, um, with respect to the uh, the stack and such. So what do we have? We have, uh, which one is uh, global up here? Oh yeah, this one right here I guess, right? And uh, which ones are local? All right, A, B, C, and X, Y, Z, and R. All right, now keep in mind that these are definitions of local variables, and so typically a local variable will have space on the stack. So even though you're passing a value into the, uh, into the function, it will take space on the stack. I think you're familiar with control structures, so I'm going to go through these really fast. Um, if, there you go, if something then do an action else, do something else. Remember you can have uh, curly brackets inside of these if you want to do multiple things. The switch is probably one of the more uh, powerful ones, but with that respect, inside you have an expression, and so you're kind of limited to individual constants. So one example would be uh, the exercise that I did previously where we looked at a little bit of code, right? Um, specifically, after you do your analog to digital conversion for lab number two, you're going to light up zero through ten LEDs. Could you actually do a switch with that? Yes. Oh yeah, if you do a arithmetic expression up here and you identify a number between 0 and 10, then you could say in the case of 0, 10, 1, etc, etc, etc. In other words, you could set a bit pattern. Yeah, you're going to output in port uh, 1 something and in port 2 something else because you needed, remember, 10 bits to be able to do this and most likely, oh, you had to split it between two different ports. A while loop, while the, uh, uh, the test inside of there is true, then do the loop body. And our most common one that we love to see is while one. Oh, interesting, test is evaluated before executing the loop body because that's going to differ from the do loop where it's assessed afterwards. And then a, finally a four, uh, another popular one, initial value, the end test value, reinitialize. Be very careful here that if you mean less than or equal to versus less than that you, uh, you include the correct whatever you mean and of course, the uh, reinitialization, reinitializing value, very often we're doing something like I++. The good programming practices mean that whatever variable you're using inside of here, you never change inside of the body of your for statement. So if you're using I, and you set i is equal to zero to begin with, you do not use inside the body, you do not change the value of i. So this would be a big no-no. 
And there's a lot of, you can do it, physically you can do it, but it's poor programming practice because you want to limit the variable itself to changes in the for statement. You could use the i as an index value to, for example, um, reference an array inside, but you don't want to change the value. So if you have something inside, like you have uh, the variable abc, which is a, or aba, since I already wrote a, and you have it in, inside of a, uh, you know, curly brackets, it is okay to say i plus one because you're referring to the i plus one element inside that array, but you haven't changed i. I think you pretty much know what the ASCII uh, characters are, right? These are particularly helpful when you are going and debugging code and you're looking at memory locations. Obviously, you won't be able to, uh, by eye, look at the hex values for code, but you will be able to identify characters. And in fact, the debugger typically shows you the translation of um, the, ASCII the ASCII representation of whatever memory location you're looking at. And that way you could find things like uh, um, the beginning of uh, a message that you're sending to a screen. This is a skill. Have we talked about masking yet in this class? No. Yes, no. Which, which is it? Yeah. All right. Let's take a vote by hands. Have I talked about this, yes or no? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, how have I missed that many? You can look at the notes then. Obviously, if I want to identify just this one bit, I could and it with a one in that position or several bits. The reason why you might want to do this is, well, a good example is the uh, ADC, right? The analog to digital converter. You only want to look at the first 12 bits and you may have junk that shows up in the top four bits. So in this case, I would mask it with all ones in all this position. And that way you pretty much zero these out. And that's the reason why you would want to mask. And that is a bitwise and. There is also a bitwise or which will allow you to do something as well. We've looked at code examples. Uh, specifically, well, let's take a look at this. What have I done in this line of code right here, which is a little bit different than what we showed earlier? Okay, we did something called typecasting. So, port one dot bidr dot bit dot b zero is a single bit. So by actually casting it into an integer, it will create an entire, how many bits is an integer? 16 bits for our compiler, as we uh, looked at a little bit earlier. Now, the code may already do this correctly, but it's always good to try and work with the same, the same uh, type of data on one side as is on the other side, and in fact, it would be also good to, in this case, notice that we're going to be anding something with an integer as well. Well, in this case, what is this right here? It's obviously a byte, so it's going to be eight bits. We cast it into an integer, and then we're going to be doing an integer and with an integer. And the result is an integer, which we've defined over there. So what does this code do? All right, simply data is gonna contain information associated with pressing the switches, or not pressing the switches. By the way, if I press no switches, what will my data be? 
<laughs> what will the value data be if I don't press any switches? And the answer is 7, right? 1, 1, 1. So if I press uh, switch 1 and switch 3, what will data equal? 2, right? Because I'm pressing this, which ties it down to 0 or ground. I press this, which ties this down to 0 or ground. This is still with a pull-up resistor tied to voltage, so you're having, or you will have 0, 1, 0, which, since we're representing an integer, will be the value of 2. And why do we do this in the, why do we do this at all? All right, we're masking it because port 1 may have other things going on that I am not aware of, and I want to make sure that I just ignore those as an input and just look at bit 0, 1, and 2 of our port number 1. And that's going to be a lot of what you're going to be doing in, for this class coming up. Uh, so, what I want you to do is to think about, hmm, if I had, uh, if I had this code from earlier, right, this one right here, if I had that from earlier, what code would I need to write here to be able to identify the functionality that I'm asking for, you know, like switch one press, switch two press, switch three pressed. And oh, by the way, notice that if we press multiple switches, will we have multiple lines pressed or printed? Yes, why is that? Because we have if, 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 no else is in there. So take a few minutes and write that code for me. I'll just do a few of these things. So what is, uh, what's going to be different here? So what is this? What am I going to write here? Not equal to 2? Not and two. All right. And this one is going to be not and four. And obviously, this is switch two pressed. This is switch three pressed. And this down here is going to be all right. A no, not all right. Then it's going to say no switches pressed. Now, of course, there may be a situation where somewhere in the middle of pressing this one and then you s suddenly let up and by the time it reaches this one, it'll print both switch one pressed and no switches pressed. But the chance of that with code is extremely unlikely. And there's other problems too associated what, with what we call switch debounce. The uh, mechanical problem associated with when you press a switch, it makes a contact and releases it and it finally makes a contact. By the way, this is a regularly scheduled test of the UNC Charlotte Emergency Alert System. Those of you who don't have that should probably think about this. Okay, um, upper lower case, uh, we actually have an option to convert between the two. Uh, a good example would be you can OR the value 2, 0, byte with a capital to make it a lower case. Or you can add 20. The safest thing to do would be to OR it. And to convert from lower case to capitals, you could subtract. But the safest thing to do is to AND it such that this bit right here is going to, uh, in a capital letter, this bit is always zero. And in a lowercase letter, 
in ASCII, this bit is always 1. One-dimensional arrays are stored in memory, and I'm just going to show you 8 bits wide if you identify a character. Obviously, it's going to take up one character for each uh, location. If we have an integer, that means it takes up two bytes, and it will be sequential, 0, 1, 2. So if we store uh, character A, B, and C, this is how it will be stored. If we're stay, uh, storing 10, 20, 30, this is how it will be stored. Notice that right here, is this big or little endian? Are you sure? You don't know. Actually, I'm just kind of like putting the number 10 right there in the middle, right? So, you know, this is the lower address, this is the higher address. This is, I didn't say it's on the upper byte or the lower byte. So this is an example of, we're going to be uh, Endian agnostic. In other words, we don't have to worry about it. And in fact, here's the interesting thing is, is um, unless you're looking at actual memory, you don't have to worry about it. If we have two-dimensional arrays, it's going to be uh, storing all the values in the rows and then it will advance to the next column. Do I have this thing correct? So this is uh, rows and columns. Let me look at this. Oh, row major form or row at a time. I think I actually have uh, uh, things kind of messed up. This is odd. So let me think about this for a moment. Hmm. Oh, I'm storing it by rows. Okay. Yeah, I'm storing row, row major, so I'm being a little bit, uh, really, really funny. So um, row one, column, or row zero, column zero, row one, column one. Yeah, that, that's right. I'm just confused myself. So it's stored in row major, meaning that the... Uh, all the columns in a particular row are saved first. I think that's what I said, isn't it? Oh well. This is the way it should be, so. Now, this is the one thing that confuses most people. And this is pointers. And so, if you want to understand pointers well, it's good to revisit these two pages in the slides and understand it really, really well. So, a pointer holds the address of data rather than the data itself. So, a pointer variable holds the address. So, in this case, i and j are variables. Star p1 is going to be a pointer to data, but it doesn't store it. So in this case, let's take a look at what we have. If the value of i is 4 and j is 3, then we're going to take the address of i and store it in p1. p1 represents a pointer, basically an address. So then when we refer to star p1, we're saying, all right, to the data in p1, Add it to the data pointed to by P2, I should say. To the data pointed to by P1. Add it to the data pointed by P2. So in this case, P1 points to 4, P2 points to 3, just as we show up here. Oh, we also have a, uh, a scheduled test. Interesting, I got the text before uh, uh, the alert. So, if we look at the, the different steps, one, two, three, four, we're storing uh, the data, then we're actually identifying the pointer, then we are adding the value, 
basically 4, 2, the value, 3, and we're going to store it to whatever P1 points to, which is I. So then in step number 5, this will be 7. And then finally, at this point, remember P1 without the star in front of it refers to the address stored at P1. And in this case, we're just copying these. They both, P1 and P2, will point to the same variable. Let's look at another example. In this case, A is defined as an array of integers. This will be the, um, the pointer for an integer. And at this point, we are pointing to the which element of A? The sixth element of A. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The sixth element of A. In this case, we're storing the value of right here, the address of the sixth element we're storing in P. So when you use star P, that will be the uh, um, whatever this is pointing to, which it turns out to be the sixth element. So we're putting five in there, right? Now we're saying P plus plus. We don't have the asterisk in front of it, so we're incrementing an address. Now, do we know how big the address is? Is the address 16 bits or is it 32 bits? Now the data is 16 bits, but the address itself is likely 32 bits for our processor because RAM needs 32 bits to address it. Question? Yeah. You define the point as an integer. So if you have 32 bits, then you don't have 16 two bits of the higher. So the integer refers to that this is going to point to an integer. Remember that this is a pointer which says that whatever my memory system uses for, or my uh, a compiler and microprocessor uses for the width of an address, that's what we have to use for how much space it will take up. So the pointer is going to be 32 bits, but it points to an integer that is 16 bits. That's an important point to note. That's a good question. So in this case, this P++ will likely add what? One. So it'll add one to the reference. In other words, it will go from A5 to A6, but that likely is a representation of four bytes. Oh, hold it. Is that right? No, it's not four bytes. I'm take this back. Two bytes. Two bytes. You're right. So uh, because the data itself is two bytes. So the address will increment by two because it's pointing to the, uh, um, the data. Uh, and then in this case, we're going to store in A6 the value of seven. And then we decrement, which so will take two off of the address, which will then point to, at this point, A5. Let's see how much more I do. So what else do pointers do? And we're going to see a little bit later when we talk about heaps. Uh, pointers and stacks, we're going to look at that as well. So data structures, how many have had a good data structures class? Ooh, wow, I may have to go over data structures in great detail. I'll probably do it in the next class then. Trees, lists. Binary trees, uh, doubly linked list, etc. We're going to look at a lot of that. Oh, look at that. We have another s test for the emergency system. And uh, you also can use it for accessing uh, strings. By the way, when you're storing strings, if you identify some data to put in there, like T E S T I N G, 
Notice the double uh, quotes here that identifies a string. It will automatically add the null character all the way at the end. And then there will be what in these other two positions? Garbage. We don't know. Whatever was in there beforehand will be in there. When you are looking at uh, formatting strings, for example, with a printf, sprintf, and fprintf, you can look at these examples. I think you could look at this as well as I can. And I think a lot of you have had this already, right? Who has not seen this yet with C? All right, so uh, you can pretty much get the flavor of it with this and I'm, I'm just going to go on. And some more examples with floating point and uh, some more examples if you want to uh, align it uh, one way or the other. There are also some string operations. Specifically, you can, uh, you can do a string copy, you can do a string concatenate, cheesy poofs. Uh, if you don't know what a cheesy poof is, I see grins. So obviously you must be a, uh, a South Park fan, right? You, you watch South Park? Uh, yes. Oh yeah, so if you watch South Park, uh, Cartman I believe is the one who loves cheesy poofs. So uh, uh, there are other operations, for example, you can uh, do a concatenate with a certain number of characters. You would also compare strings. I think you all have had this before. I don't really need to go into that. You can also um, identify a pointer to the first occurrence of a particular character or the last occurrence or you can try and uh, uh, do other examples like use the return pointer for other purposes. So with that I'm going to say we'll address this in our next class. All right, welcome back to uh, uh, our video recording. I'm going to start now with, uh, with dynamic memory allocation and this will finish up the C review. Uh, as I said, I'm going through really fast so I thought uh, this would be of value to, to take a look at. But I'm also going to talk about uh, some other concepts today, especially, um, especially uh, uh, some concepts associated with uh, um, memory structures or I should say uh, data structures. So when we're running uh, in a computer, even, even uh, your PC, uh, but especially with a const memory constrained device like an embedded system, you may have changing me memory requirements. In other words, a certain functionality may need a lot of memory and then suddenly it doesn't need any, any more memory and then maybe another time you need some, some more memory for something else. A good example is a uh, mobile phone. And every so often, the mobile phone will want to sort all of, the, uh, all of the names in its address book. And to sort, you're going to need some extra memory to help you with algorithms that allow you to sort. And so you'll want to grab some memory, use it, and then free it up. And we have a, uh, an ability to do that with a dynamic memory allocation uh, mechanism called a heap. And in a heap, you can allocate memory a certain size and then refer to that, uh, that memory with a pointer. Remember, we covered uh, pointers in our last class. So to actually allocate n bytes, you would do a malloc, and that is a memory allocation. Or you can allocate a certain number of elements of a certain size. And this is probably more appropriate if, if you want to allocate memory associated with, uh, let's say, a bunch of integers. And maybe you want to allocate a thousand integers. So how much memory is that? 2,000 bytes, right? Because an integer is two bytes. By the way, some systems an integer is four bytes. 
But in our Renaissance, it's going to be two bytes. A long integer would be four bytes. So you would say, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to allocate a thousand elements, and the size is going to be on, and this is where you would put something in there like integer or long word or something like that. You could also change the side of that block, and it's really important at the end, you need to free that memory. In other words, you only have a certain amount of heap memory available, and you need to release it or free it up when you're done using it. In fact, Windows sometimes has a problem with this historically that um, applications will grab that memory and not free it up so that when the uh, application ends, that memory is still allocated and eventually you run out of memory. And a reason you might want to do that is, well, in this case, we're going to request space for one or more new variables. Again, these are, is uh, this an integer or a pointer to an integer? So it's going to be pointing to an integer. I should say the actual storage is going to be an address which will point to an integer. And so in this case, J is an address and the malloc will actually return a pointer to a single space or a single memory location which is two bytes. In this case you're going to uh, calloc a whole bunch of elements. In this case uh, we don't know how many num elements is but we know it is the size of integer and so this would tell you that it's going to be two bytes and you're going to need maybe a thousand of these. If you have enough memory, it'll give you an address, or if it returns null, in other words, the address zero, that means that there was not enough memory to give you. Again, remember, free it up when you're done. Now, a calic and a free are actually two, two instructions that really need an operating system present because a calic actually will allocate as you're running the execution. So you really need to have a decent memory or uh, operating system that is maintaining a heap. And we'll see examples of this a little bit later. So let's take a look of, at a simple example. We have a, uh, a voice recorder. So you've probably seen them. They're, you know, in the old days, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, small little device that you can press a button and record a memo to yourself, you know, pick up eggs and milk from the store, something like that. And so while you're pressing the record switch on this device, the microphone will sample or the processor will mi sample the microphone and it will store whatever the utterance is in a RAM buffer and then when you release the record switch then it will take that audio that you uh, that you created and it will store it in a more permanent place because this is temporary and you'll store it in a permanent place and uh, oh and then it will keep like a list of recordings you know this is recording one, recording two, recording three and you'll actually point to the next recording because you'll also have a couple other switches available. One that says move forward to the next recording and play it or maybe even delete the current recording. And the data structure that we're going to use is what's called a link list. So let's take a look at an example. So I press the record button and inside the buffer it's going to record a certain utterances and then I'm done. So I need to permanently store this. So I have this variable which is actually going to point to a data structure which points to this recording. So what I'll do is I'll record or I'll malloc or alloc some space. 
I'll copy the buffer, what I actually talked over to this space. And here's a neat thing. The buffer was a certain size, like what I would think would be the maximum size of my recording. But when I malloc, I know exactly how much space that's going to take. And I will record only that amount, of, or I will uh, allocate only that amount of space. So now I have this saved in memory. But I want to point to it later. So what I'll do is I'll create a structure. And this data structure will have two things. One is it'll have a pointer to the beginning of this utterance. Actually, it'll have three things. One will be a pointer to the beginning of this utterance. It'll also store the length of this recorded uh, voice. And it will then also point to the next one. And so often what we'll see, I'll point to this, is when we started off, this is how I learned data structures when I was a young lad. This would point to null. It looks like ground, right? Has anybody ever seen this in data structures? Yes, no? If it's yes, raise your hand. I want to make sure. So, all right, so at least some of you have seen it, so I, I don't know how old I, I am. You know, I'm, I'm teaching stuff that I learned back in 1980s, all right? Oops. All right, so we recorded. We saved it. We created a data structure, and one of the elements points to the beginning of my recording. And what happens is that now that I have recorded a new utterance or uh, uh, something new, then this will then point to the next element or the next recording. Well. If it's the only recording, then it's going to point to nothing. So I'll, I'll put null in there. All right, so I'm going to record, record something new. So I'll record in, this, uh, record in this temporary area. Then I'll allocate some space. I'll copy it over. I'll create another element in my data structure. Part of this points to the uh, uh, recording itself and its length. And then I will uh, modify my um, I will modify my data structure so that I'll point to the next recording. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, that will be pointing to nothing. And then I'll record something else. This is a long recording, and since buffer is temporary, you know, it's just recording over something previously. I know its length. So I'll mallocate some space. I'll uh, copy it over. I'll create the other, and this is also a malloc or an allocation. Point to my uh, recording. Instead of uh, pointing to nothing, I'll now point to the new uh, point to the new recording. And then maybe based on me pressing my buttons, I'll want to delete something. So you know I've gone through and I'll delete this current one. So what do I do? Well, first thing I do is I free that space. And so that now space is available to be used by another, uh, um, by, for another recording. And this entire data structure I can get rid of. So I don't need that data structure. Of course, the, the pointer to that I'm not going to need. But this was the first recording and this is the third recording. I need to make sure that the first recording is now going to point to the third recording, which will be stored as the second now. And so I'll need to change that uh, pointer right there as well. So what I'm going to show you is the code associated with that data structure and that operation. And you never know when you're going to need this type of code because you never know when something like this might show up on a quiz at the end of class. Hint, hint, hint. <clears throat> so to what I have, I have a data structure and it's type depth structure. 
I have the size of this. Unsigned integer means the maximum size can be how big? 2 to the 16th minus 1, which is 64K. You know, 65,000... 536, something like that, all right? A very big number, 64K. Then we're going to have a character pointer. So our data that we're actually recording is going to be byte by byte. And we have a star here because it's going to be a pointer. So this data structure really represents this right here. And then, oh look at this, we're also going to have a pointer to the same thing, right? So, interesting enough, one of the elements here points to another one. So we already have a structure identified, pointer, we're going to call it next. So the, how much memory actually does this structure entail if we're using our MSP4, I'm sorry, our uh, Renaissance RX63N? How big is an, is an integer? Two bytes, right? This is a pointer. So how long is this? Four bytes because it's an address, right? And this is what? Next is going to be an address as well, because it's pointing to something else, which means it's going to be how many bytes? Four bytes as well. So this entire data structure will take up 10 bytes in, this, uh, in our system. So now we have that individual length list element right there is represented by this data structure. So interesting enough, if, if not only I wanted to point in one direction, but I wanted to point in another direction, what do you think I would have to add? All right, you'd have to add one more pointer in here, right? Hint, hint. So here's my base code. There's my main, and I know this is an embedded system. Why? While one. There we go. So we have a while one in there. It turns out that our max buffer size is going to be something, right? By the way, how big is the, how big can the max buffer size be anyhow? Are you sure? No. What's the maximum size? Ten bytes. What's the maximum size? The number of bytes. 64K, right? So wouldn't it come, wouldn't it seem logical that max buffer size would be something 64K or less? Because otherwise you can't store the size of it if it's bigger than 64K. So this is going to have to be 64K or less. A K being 1024 in our, in our case. Now, the other thing that we're doing is we're identifying a variable called recordings. What is recordings? Well, it turns out that recordings is this right here. It starts out as empty, null, but it's going to point to the first recording, right? So we're going to create that. But we also have one that's going to point to the current recording because if you remember our operation, we allow you to use a forward switch. So this will always point to the first recording but I may have another one that points to the current one because I may press the forward button and I may press the play or delete button. 
So the play or delete will act on whatever I'm currently pointing to. So if we look at our, our general uh, um, our general execution here. So if record, meaning if we're pressing the record button, then we're going to run some function that's going to handle the record, right? Or if you're, if you press the play button, then it will take care of play. If you press the forward button, it will take care of forward. If you have press the handle delete, it'll take care of delete, all right? So what's the nice thing about this right here? I mean, this whole main program is very readable, relatively short. All the functionality is done in one, two, three, four subroutines or functions. So let's look at one of these. Handle forward. Hmm, that's interesting. If current recording, what does this mean if current recording? Oh, so if it's not null, right? So if it's not null, then you could do something. If it is null, that means you just make this recordings, you just make whatever that is equal to current recording. If current recording is not null, then what you do is you just replace it to the next recording. And if you remember our data structure, it could turn out that this was nothing, right? And it could turn out that the next recording is null. So in that case, this code would make it null. But here's the interesting thing. If you are pointing to the last recording, will this code then point you to null, or will it exit pointing to the first recording? It will point to the first, because this is an if, not an if-else. So it could happen that current recording will be set to null if it's pointing to the last element, and then this piece of code that runs immediately afterwards will say, oh yeah, and if it is null, then go to the beginning and the current recording will now point to the first, the first recording. So let's take a look for handling the recording. Ooh, this is where all the good alloc and malloc is being handled, right? So what I would like you to do is to take a look at this and think about it for, well, I'll explain some things, and then I'm going to talk about um, a problem with this. All right? So, and actually, I'm going to have you debug it, but don't say it yet. So, remember, this is, a, this is a function. So that means that this is temporary, this is temporary, this is temporary, this is temporary. And remember, this is, you're pressing the record button. And this is a global variable that will be accessible by this function. And you're going to run some other subroutine or some other function to record. And you're going to store it away until you lift your finger off the record button. Then you're going to have what your size is. Then you're going to have, uh, you're going to create space, enough space for your recording. And it's going to be a, uh, a character array up to how many bytes? 64K. Then what you're going to do is you're going to copy it over from your temporary buffer to the space you just allocated. Then this code right here will create your data structure. Remember this data structure right here? that we defined with this. So now we're going to create this and fill it. So let's create it. Ooh, I'm going the wrong way. That's why it's messing up. So let's fill it. We've created it right here. And new recording, remember, is an address 
that points to the beginning of the recorded video, or I'm sorry, recorded audio that, audio that we just saved. So there it is. Audio data, that is our, a pointer to our data. Then the size, in other words, how much uh, space that we have uh, allocated is going to be saved. And since this is the very last recording, we set it to null. And then we have some other function here that will allow us to add it to the end of our, um, our, our previous one. So it, that will be a special function that will, uh, for example, um, in this case, it will do the operation, you know, we did that, we allocated malloc this space, we copied it over, then we malloc this data structure, then we attached it, or then we pointed to this, and then the append will be able to, this will be what happens in the append function. We'll have to take the previous uh, uh, recording and have it point to this. That looks pretty easy, right? There is a problem with this code, though. There's a bug, and so uh, there's a pretty big bug in here. So what I would like you to do is to uh, spend a few minutes, turn to your neighbor, and figure out what the bug is and how you would fix it. All right, we are back online, and uh, this was uh, this is a is this tricky? One thing I uh, gave you a hint, at least I said you can hold down the button and record forever. But it could be even worse than that. For example, your max buffer size right here is allocated up to 64K. What if you don't use the maximum that fits in an integer of 64K? Let's say you use 40,000, right? What occurs, what is stored, I should say, right after the temporary buffer? The pointer to, to my entire data structure, right? Well, what could happen is if I hold the buffer or the record button down, keeping in mind that the buffer only holds 40,000 bytes, but I have no check in here to say stop at 40,000. It could keep on going and even though it's not officially available for buffer, this is C code, it does keeps on going. And so this would actually keep on recording over whatever is in memory after buffer, which means your data structure pointing to all your recordings would be overwritten, which means that your entire system would be worthless. You would not be able to use it anymore. And so there's a quick and easy fix to this. Any hints? All right, so you're going to look at something associated with I, and you want it less than... Max buffer size, right? Yes. So this would be so much easier if I had a pen. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. <laughs> and then this would be a... A single and? Ah, the single and is a bitwise and. So since this is a logical thing, we have a double and. All right? And uh, remember, the max buffer size, this would be less than because, you know, if your max buffer size is 40,000, you start counting at zero. So definitely it would have to be less than. Now, do I need to do any checking with size? Is that okay? Yeah, that should be okay because size is going to be I++, right? 
And in fact, oh, or is it? Oh yeah, it'll be because this I++. But for the first recording, we will have uh, I less than the buffer anyways. And uh, if it goes in and uh, there's a infinite recording, it's it for like a long time. Uh, well, we'll take a, let's take a look at this. Even if you're holding down the record key, as soon as you do the the max buffer, right? Does the record have any influence on anything else here? No. So it has no influence whatsoever until you return from this handle record, come back out, and you're pressing the record button again. So if you just kept on holding down the record button and talked, it would do what? It would, it would just keep on doing that. And so the only thing that might, you know, you might be able to play, you might be able to record something that's really long because it would be several entries. The unfortunate thing is that there will be some time delay, right? executing this code right here. So that code, whatever time that code took, would be the break in what was actually recorded. So that may not be such a bad thing, right? If you wanted to delete, you can do something like this. You can uh, say that your uh, uh, recordings, in fact, you're pointing to the current one, right? That's your, uh, your current recordings. So if you want to uh, um, if your uh, current recordings is the, the very first recording, what it does is it replaces the very uh, the pointer to the very first recording to the next one. So this is the situation where you want to delete the first recording. Otherwise, what you do is you just delete that uh, that recording inside of you know the second or the third or the fourth or whatever. And all you're doing here is you're fixing the pointer. You're you're just transferring the pointer from one to the next. And you're freeing up the space. And notice you're not having to do anything like uh, deleting the contents of any of these because by freeing the space up, you're saying this is now available to use by somebody else. Now, a problem that you're going to have with this entire uh, concept of heaps is that you may have this space used, and then this space used, and this space used, but this is the open space, and this is the open space, and this is the open space, and this is the open space. So it becomes fragmented. You have lots of extra space laying around. Let's see. Um, this is a way to fix it. I'm not going to go into that in great detail. The dangers of doing this dynamic memory allocation is if you have a bad programmer who didn't actually use free, then you're going to have what we call a memory leak. Or you may accidentally free the memory <laughs> that you don't want to really free it yet. And you may have fragmentation over time. Uh, this just talks more about it. Uh, let's see. I believe I have already talked about algorithm, right? We looked at this. You know what an algorithm is, right? Al Gore. Rhythm. See, that's Al Gore. Oh, nobody wants an A in this class. Nobody's laughing. All right. You create algorithms in the design phase. The reason why you want to do this is. You want to have a good flavor of what's going on with your entire system before you start going into um, before you start going to writing the actual code. Um, and I've already covered this in a in a previous class, so I don't really need to go into this in great detail. The other thing is, um, you know, as I said, do yourself a favor, 
write the algorithm before the code. And you could actually have this code, the pseudocode, for example, uh, that you write for your algorithm. You could actually have that and use that as your comments. And that's what I recommend. How many of you did that for the uh, lab number two? Yeah, not everybody, not everybody, not very good. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll uh, do that more in the future. That will give you uh, better scores. Um, I had an example here which was uh, kind of small. So in, uh, in conclusion, please use uh, algorithms whenever you have the opportunity. For a lot of the labs coming up in the future, I may actually have a quiz where you're, uh, I'm going to force you to actually work on an algorithm. That's it for this lecture. Thank you.